Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who is joining us for today's webinar. Um, and uh, for today's webinar, Reimagining Your Contact Center Enablement Solutions with our presenter, Linda Lampart. For myself, my name is Kim Heyer. I'm with GP Strategies, and I'm happy to be your host for today's session. So before I hand it over to Linda, I just want to cover a couple things. First, for those of you who are joining us, um, we will be uh, sending a link to the recording and a copy of today's presentation um, within the next 24 hours. So for those of you who are joining us live, you will get that. Um, for And as always, everybody's lines are muted, and but we always try to make this as interactive as possible. So I encourage you to contribute during the webinar. So if you have any comments for Linda, please use the chat to engage with her, as well as all the other attendees that may be joining us today. I do ask that if you have any specific questions to use the Q&A option. So that way, as we're responding, we can um, keep them in check. So again, I want to thank you guys for joining us and for today's session, and I'm excited to introduce you to today's presenters. Linda Lampert worked for over 25 years in the field of human performance technology, helping clients improve the overall performance of their organizations and employees. She also has over 20 years of experience designing and delivering solutions for companies, implementing traditional ERP and cloud-based systems. In addition, Linda focuses on the people-related challenges associated with global process and system transformations, as well as integration of mobile and micro learning strategies to streamline a platform adoption. So I know we have a great session planned for today. And with that, I am going to hand it off to Linda and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kim. Hey, everybody. It's great to be with you today. Uh, I see one American League East person uh, on the line, but Perhaps, um, Alan, you're not a huge, I don't know if you're a huge baseball fan or not, but um, I am a huge Orioles fan and life is good right now. The picture is um, not my normal headshot. It's me at opening day at Camden Yards this spring. Um, so we are walking on sunshine right now here in Baltimore. Um, so nice to join you all today. Um, as we are talking today, I'm hoping we can keep this a little bit interactive. So if you have any quick questions, I've got the chat open. Um, I wanted to start out today just talking a little bit about some of the many, many, many workforce and technology changes that are impacting um, contact center or call center operations these days. I've been, had a chance to work over the last uh, year and a half, probably with uh, a number of um, organizations that are dealing with the challenges that um, a lot of you might be seeing if you're working with contact center groups. Um, I want to take that and then look at the, the conditions that we look at to drive organizational performance and think a little bit about how that's being impacted, how those um, conditions are being impacted by all these changes. And, and then extrapolate that a minute to really talk about how are we needing to evolve our employee onboarding and our learning and our performance support for those audiences. Um, and then finally wrap up a little bit with next steps for your organization that you might want to be considering as you think about all these changes that are about to hit you like a giant tsunami. Uh, and then we'll have time at the end for Q&A uh, and to close up and uh, answer any further questions. And, and maybe uh, I'd love to hear from you all about the big things that are that are impacting you these days. So, um, you know, just kicking off, I'm wondering if anybody can share with them, I'm, I've got a list of things that have really been hitting organization uh, organizations over the last couple of uh, years, you know, changes in um, either in how your contact centers are operating, are they full-time or part-time virtual? Do you have new staffing models that are being involved um, that are coming? Um, have you had a lot of turnover, increased challenges in retaining existing and experienced people, um, changes to how your new agents need to be monitored and given feedback, um, and then changes in your expectations from your customers your, and your employees? Um, 
around the technology that's helping them changes in your customer ex expectations regarding service. I think those are all things that many of us are seeing, regardless of our industry, um, regardless of what we're doing. Um, you know, and a lot of these are pandemic related things. So obviously COVID has proven that many kinds of work can be done remotely. Um, many contact centers are working either fully um, or partially remotely. And that is something that I think if you had said that 10 or 15 years ago, people would have been like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And not only are, you know, that works being done remotely, but, you know, we say I'm working from home, but remotely doesn't just mean at home these days. So depending on the kind of work you're doing, where you're doing it from, it could be from, you know, a co-work location. It could be from Starbucks, <laughs> lots of different places. So um, remotely doesn't just mean at home. And of course that has huge implications for us from a technology perspective. Um, then also really integrally, in integrally, um, Related to that, transitions to new staffing models. So whether that is working with contract employees onshore, near shore, offshore, um, having people be part time or full time, a lot of new staffing models that are coming out. And then how do you support those staffing models has also had a lot of uh, impacts on the organization. Um, obviously, the great resignation has hit a lot of organizations. So the workforce itself is a lot less experienced potentially um, because of that great resignation. And then one that I'm not sure that we all think about as much as we need to is this whole impact of having the experience economy. And if you think back, you know, three or four years ago to when you started going on to Amazon uh, to do all that ordering of stuff, and it was amazing because Amazon knew what you needed before you even knew what you needed. And they knew the best thing for you. And that kind of experience economy that now everybody is used to, and it started out there, but it spread to online ordering for food delivery and all kinds of areas where you, we didn't even have those options three, four years ago. Um, that's really changed our expectations as consumers but it's also changed the expectations of all of our employees in terms of how they're gonna be supported. So what they might have tolerated or been happy with a few years ago, they are now have bigger expectations for more customized learning journeys, for more customized performance support, for things that are uh, offering to them what they didn't even know that they needed. So huge pandemic related impacts. And uh, I'll be interested to see if you wanna share in the chat, are those things that you all have been experiencing in your organizations? Um, and or the, are there things that, that are there that maybe you aren't experiencing? I'm not sure. I know for us, we see this all the time, both internally and, and with our customers. The other thing that we need to think about too, is in terms of technology advances. Um, obviously, technology was really starting to change in the last um, few years before the pandemic, and then it's just accelerated since then. So we're looking at things like, you know, everybody's dealing with omni-channel right now, not just somebody picking up the phone, but, you know, web chats, SMS messaging, email, social media, all of those different um, uh ways of having our customers or potential customers reach out to us have to be dealt with. Um, automatic call distributor and um, interactive voice response has totally changed the, um, the processing of those contacts. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but when I call somewhere, I'm paying attention to how those how that technology is working. How many times do I have to press one or five? If I say I want to talk to an agent, does it give me to an agent or does it try and understand? Um, speech and text analytics is another big technology advance that some customer, some companies are starting to use, but uh, that's going to continue to have us, uh, you know, it used to be you would double mic someone to be able to listen to their calls and, you um, now we can use speech and text analytics to look at that and give us insight. Um, Self-service customer service is another area um, that is really 
starting to rear its head as something to pay attention to. Um, the more calls we can get, the more issues and more questions we can get addressed through self-service customer service, the better. At the same time, all that content that's available to the public outside of the organization mirrors content, content that we have internally. And how do you keep that synced up? How do you keep those conversations um, aligned so that they're hearing the same thing no matter how they get the information? Nancy, I see your comment about hiring and training during COVID's left residual issues of inconsistent training and poor hiring effects. Absolutely, absolutely. And some of that, especially early on, that training we were trying to deliver where we were just finding our way into doing things virtually, um, you know, it's, it's a good question. Are those folks all at the same place where we would expect them to be? And how do we address those pain points that might exist in the organization right now. And I think one of those actually is this, you know, there's an opportunity in this last thing I have listed under technology advances, which is the just huge amount of um, advances that are possible on quality assurance and analytics and some of the technologies that are, are there right now to be able to go in and look at um, what's really happening in our contact centers um, with a lot more detail and a lot more finesse ability to really fine tune our results is going to be huge towards looking at some of that, uh, some of those residual is instances or issues that are, that you're seeing. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm thinking that many of you probably have one or more of these things. Is there anything maybe on this list here that you're interested in that you guys haven't started looking at yet or haven't, haven't implemented yet? Um, I think I'm guessing, you know, certainly the first two people are into, but some of the, you know, speech and text analytics and the QA um, and reporting is is something that I think a lot of people are just starting to to really dip their toes in. Um, you know, so as we think about kind of where we're at with with all of these impacts, I like to go back and really, you know, oh, I'm sorry. It, I'm skipping ahead a second because the biggest impact and the thing that is really going to be getting us going is AI. Um, and I went to a um, conference last week from Google Cloud where they were talking about the possibilities and had some of their customers talking about how they're using AI right now to support uh, employees in the workplace was one of the ways that they're using it. And just some really fascinating possibilities here. I, you know, I don't think there's a huge number of companies right now that are doing a lot here, but everybody's talking about it. And the, with the speed with which this is going to hit us, you know, a year from now, we will all be looking back and uh, maybe have a little bit of whiplash, but we'll be in a completely different place, I would guess. And, you know, the idea that AI can sit, I think the one that really was exciting to me was the idea of almost an AI assistant that's sitting with our contact center folks, watching what they're doing and being able to provide the next best alternative to provide that content that they need or even, you know, probably the easiest of all of that is to have the, the AI assistant listening to the conversation, watching the conversation, creating notes that the agent can then review, make sure they're right, because they might not have caught it right, review, make sure it's right and save. And they were saying, you know, for organizations that are starting to implement this kind of technology, their agents are saving, you know, like having a 30% time savings, which is huge. That's a huge impact, um, and that's just the beginning. So, um, how AI hits us is is going to have a huge impact in how we onboard people, how we train them, how we support them. Um, it's it's going to be huge because it's just going to change change the lens that we need to look at things through. So, with that being said, you know I go back to. Uh, the, a model that we've used for years and years to think about how do we as, an organ as organizations drive the business results we're looking for. And in this model that we've used for years, um, you know, you have up at the top there on the left, your executive leadership, and they're identifying and thinking about the business results that they want to create for the organization up there in the upper right-hand side. And by identifying those business results, they then set the 
set the direction for the organization and put in place what's needed to drive those business results. And that comes in the form of conditions that they're going to establish. So they're, whoops, I just went back. Conditions like culture and engagement of the organization, knowledge and skills of the employees, the processes, the tools that are being used, and the technology that's being used. And all of that direction and those conditions is then pushed down to the leaders of the leaders, and then the frontline leaders who come up with team outcomes, and then the individuals who have their individual um, outcomes that are identified. And it's those individual outcomes that then drive the desired business results. So if we think about, in particular, those conditions that we're establishing, that's where we really start to see the impact of all these changes that we've been talking about. So just to talk about that a little bit more, thinking about culture and engagement, what implications are there for our traditional model? Well, obviously, work from home, hybrid staffing culture is a huge, huge area that's been impacted, but also the supervisory model. And if you think about our supervisory models that are traditional um, in you know, a call center, an old-fashioned call center environment, it's a lot of watching people listening in on their calls and providing feedback. Well, that's very hard if that person is you know, in one country and you're in another country or they're in you know, Oregon and uh, you're in Ontario. So um, big impacts there, obviously. In terms of processes, obviously the processes are evolving as some of those technologies are taking place. So for example, you know, if you've got your auto call distribution or interactive voice um, recognition that's routing calls differently, that's going to impact your processes. Um, QA and analytics being incorporated in and being able to continuously improve things is another big impact, those opportunities. Um, when we think about capabilities and knowledge and skills, obviously, um, we've got just an explosion of knowledge content. I was working with a customer recently, and they had 100,000 pages of knowledge that were available for their agents to reference. And we think about how do you as as a poor agent find something in 100,000 pages? Well, I'll tell you that technology that's coming is going to help with that potentially. Um, so we have this explosion of knowledge content we're dealing with as well as, and I, I call it transition to more strategic activities here, but a lot of our agents, you know, it used to be you could start people out with the easy calls um, and they could be answering simple calls. Well, a lot of those calls could potentially be on self-service these days. So customers are finding their own answers and there aren't really as many easy calls to get people started on. So how do you upskill people, train them up, support them as they're transitioning to really more strategic support modules? Um, that, is, that is another challenge for us. And then that fourth area, technology, you know, obviously a lot of the technology I just managed, the routing, um, you know, technology is having a huge impact, but also all these new tools that people are, are having access to, they need upskilling on. And typically, you know, throughout businesses, we see agile tools where there's, you know, new versions every six months or every three months. And so there's this continuous training, retraining, upskilling requirement that we didn't used to have in the olden days. Um, so a lot of changes there, a lot of implications for our traditional model of onboarding. And I'm not sure if those things are resonating with you all. Um, I hope so. And I'm, I'm guessing, Nancy, maybe, you know, the, the challenges you've had um, reflect some of the challenges that we're seeing on this, um, on this page. And so we tend to think of these things from this, this perspective, perspective, from our technology perspective, from our model. I want to switch, flip the lens for a second here for a minute and go to a more performer or learner centered experience, because I think that's really important as we're thinking about how do we start envisioning the path forward. Um, and I tend to think of kind of three buckets. Um, so learning, performance support, and knowledge. And in those three buckets, if you look at it from a learner perspective, from a performer perspective, or from your new hire perspective, you know, learning, as we're, we're starting with these folks, 
the very first thing is that they can recognize the flow of their job. They can see the direction that they're going. They can see how it all hangs together. I might call that ideational scaffolding if I wanted to sound fancy, but they they get that and they can see the learning path that they're going to take and how that's going to prepare them to work. So it all hangs together in their head. And then as they grow in their job later on, they get that refresher training or that upskilling learning that's relevant to them. And that's really the, the role of learning. And then performance support is at the moment of need, they can find the help they need and they can get to it quickly. Um, and performance support is also really what makes that training or learning stick so that they really, they learn in the flow of work. And then the third area there is knowledge. And this is a, something that I've seen a lot of our customers have just huge amounts of knowledge. It's not what's needed every day. It's what you might need every once in a while or every once in a blue moon. So, but, but when we know, when I need that knowledge, I know exactly where to find it. And I can, when I find it, it's easy to see and I'm easy to read, it's easy to read. Um, one of the things we've seen as we've been working with customers is a lot of this knowledge was put together by all these different groups and then glommed all together. So even when you land on a page, it's hard to parse kind of, okay, where am I? What's what, you know, it, you have to spend some time thinking about it and understanding it. Well, we don't have that time in, in contact center environments. We need things fast. So um, if knowledge is really what we're relying on and not performance support to help those people, that can be a challenge. Um, the other thing that I'm seeing is um, learning used to be a big proportion because performance support was a binder or something you would stick up on the wall. But with the advent of the, all the new technologies that are coming in for performance support, um, performance support is getting bigger, learning is getting smaller. We need to rely less on classroom-based or uh, virtual learning experiences and more on orienting people toward that performance support that they're going to be using. So as we think about learning, you know, a couple of big takeaways for me. One is, um, you know, as I said, so much of what people learn is on the job um, and they and they learn as they're applying what they've got. So we really need to be focusing learning on what people need in their heads before they start learning on the job, that formal stuff, and then set the stage for learning in the flow of work. Um, that means we have leaner, more effective um, orientation programs, onboarding programs, and we teach people how to fish for themselves. Now, the challenge with that is, you know, we're trying to measure the effectiveness of training. Really, we ought to be looking at the business results of it. And if that happens, then we really need to change the finish line. Um, and so when you complete training, that isn't an application back on the job. That isn't driving those business results yet, right? You really need to be measuring completion and measuring impacts by application to work and improved performance. And that's a big mental shift for us as, as trainers, as learning people. Um, and it also requires then the implementation of new ways of measuring and supporting on the job use. So the good news here is that we have great technologies that can let us do that now, and we're gonna have even more. But um, it's a mental shift from our old, you know, use of an LMS to complete to measure completions or measuring tests at the end of a of a class. Level one, level two evaluation is not going to do it for us these days. Then the second area that I talked about there that that performance support lens. Um, what we are seeing more and more, and what we are advocating for our customers is illustrated here on the screen now with one path for performance support and knowledge um, that starts most often with in-application help. So whether that's something like WhatFix or WalkMe, or if you're using an ERP system like SAP, it might be um, SAP Enable Now, but something that's in the application, giving that performance support at the time of need to complete job tasks. And then with one click, you can get to more. So you could get to linked documents. You could get to linked content of inf or other kinds of information. That's your help platform. One more click gives you an effective search um, if you can't find what you need with that first click.
click. And if we can support that with AI enablement, that's really gonna be very powerful for our um, employees. And then that's not to say that they still won't have that other knowledge that they can get to. And of course, supporting all of that, there's gonna be the new hire training and the ongoing learning and compliance training. And behind the scenes, what you don't see in this illustration is that all of these things are linked together from a technology perspective. So a little bit different lens than our traditional learning first lens, it's really focusing on performance. So that's a lot. <laughs> and um, what I'm seeing is it's a big challenge. Organizations are just sort of girding themselves to get to move forward with it. Um, and a lot of organizations are missing some maybe basic building blocks that are going to help them be ready. So the very last thing I really wanted to talk about was how can your organization start to get ready for this big challenge? And um, there's kind of four best practices here that I'm going to recommend that you start thinking about. And the first one is make sure that you have a group that's chartered to look at this, to charter to, and, and we could phrase, you could phrase it how you want to, I'm saying, you know, continual improvement of the contact center employee solution. Um, and what we see oftentimes is, you know, it's learning or it's IT or it's the business that's trying to do this. Um, and they aren't necessarily all working on this together. So having an organization, a council, that is, that is chartered, that includes all three of these groups. And if you're in a compliance related business, you want to also include risk management or whoever's, whatever you call that group to make sure that they are all talking to each other and that they are setting direction for the organization. Um, secondly, is the idea of key performance indicators. And, you know, right now there are key performance indicators that organizations have used for a long time um, that uh, are based on a business process area or uh, a role or something. But there's an opportunity for us to all take advantage of the new technology to track more detailed KPIs. And so, um, you know, I was working with one customer and they were talking about, um, you know, their three minute call time was what they were measuring to. And I said, well, what about it? You know, what if it's a more complicated call? Do they have longer? What about if it's an easy, easy call? Do they have shorter? And no, it was three minutes. So if you think about it, if you are able to track your calls around types of calls and duration, you can really do some intelligent training and performance support and maybe process redesign, all kinds of things by being able to have those more detailed KPIs. And then related to that is the third area, which is thinking about evaluation and assessment. So how are we able to measure against those KPIs so that we can um, identify and make recommendations around continuous improvements? And then the, the last area I'll mention is simply having some kind of um, group, and it might be a subset of that council, or it might be a separate group that reports to them that can deal with um, issues, issue resolution. And, you know, especially if, if we've got different groups that are trying to improve technology systems or business process or user performance, things are going to um, come to a head. And having that organization, that group uh, available and ready to address issue resolution is a really important thing. So uh, those are four key things. I will say, um, you know, at GP, we track best practices around learning and performance support and knowledge management solutions. And these are the four that have really leapt out uh, in work that I've been doing recently. So um, I'm wondering, you know, I hope they resonate with your organization. Um, this is sort of the topics that to, what I wanted to talk about today. I don't know if uh, anyone has any specific questions or if you would like to just pose some thoughts in the chat. Would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Great discussion right there. Um, let's see if you have any questions, like uh, Linda said, you can either put them in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, I do have one question that came through. 
Um, and uh, I just want to make sure I get it right. So how, how do you start the conversation with IT and the business as you're reimagining, as you were saying right now, or, or looking at different call center solutions or updating your own? Um, great, great question. Cause it's, that's really around starting to establish relationships potentially with groups that have either not worked together closely before, or have potentially been antagonistic with one another in the past. So, I mean, I think one thing is to identify key stakeholders and sponsors for this effort and make sure you're enlisting those sponsors and make sure that they understand, you know, just how important this is. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, U.S. Steel was presenting at the conference that I went to, the Google conference I went to, and they uh, were talking about, they started out with one little tiny initiative that got everybody's attention. And then suddenly everybody wanted to participate. Everybody, everybody cared about what was happening. Um, so what they did wasn't a big thing, but it got people's attention. So I think that's also a very good thing to do. And then that gets your um, sponsors to really be paying attention to the organization, to, to what's going on in the organization and what needs to happen. Thank you. Um, I have one more question uh, that I'm coming in and it says, um, can you give a, a few more examples of KPIs we should be measuring or considering? Sure, sure. So, I mean, I think in, in you know, contact center world, Duration, call duration is, um, you know, a big one. Um, also, obviously, first time, like resolution, first time is another one that people will want to look at. And uh, I think that's going to be, again, something where you're going to want to have differentiation between the types of calls, right? So if it's an easy call, you absolutely want it resolved the first time. You may have other specific calls that you want, types of calls that you want to really focus in on. So um, another thing could be how many calls are we getting that are of a certain nature? Because looking at that um, is going to give you insight into customer satisfaction and other things. It really depends on, on the industry and the kinds of things that you're getting contacts about. Um, I think also looking at what's driving um, how much self-service are you doing and what kinds of things are coming into self-service is another really interesting metric that you could potentially be tracking. Um, trying to understand are people, you know, how are people contacting us and are things that we are doing um, to support or to reinforce success for some of those areas, um, allowing us to drive more call, like drive more calls to self-service, for example. Okay. Um, so you talk about says you talk about getting a council together mm -hmm. um but how important is it or is it not to get leadership buy-in when doing oh, this absolutely critical it's absolutely critical if you if you want to spend money you need leadership buy-in and nothing's free so <laughs> <laughs> nothing is free um so so i think you know having that senior sponsor or sponsorship um, you know, one of the groups I worked with, there was a senior sponsor from IT, there was a senior sponsor from the business, and there was a senior sponsor from learning. Those were the heads of that council. And then other folks were, um, you know, supporting that as well. It wasn't just the three of them, but those were the three that really mattered. And then it was the business person who was the key sponsor, the head of that council, because what are we doing? We live to support the business and drive business results. Um, so they were really them, but they didn't, they weren't the head in the beginning. The head in the beginning was somebody from learning who was able to enlist that person and show them the importance. Great. Uh, just be conscious of time. Okay. Um, I have another question. It says, do you have any concerns about using AI in context center enablement and any advice do you have on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we've got you know, we've got data, we've got people's data, we've got proprietary data from the organization. So here's the thing that I understood from Google's perspective on this, which obviously is just one perspective, but um, what they were looking at is they have a large language model that they make available to customers 
that then partners with the business or the organization's data or model. And there is a wall between those two things. The customer data remains the customer data. The large language model from that Google has helps that function, but ne'er the two shall meet. And so you've got to have really important to have um, policies, procedures, safeguards in place to make sure that um, your data is not getting out. It's really about using AI to better understand your own content versus trying to go out to the world and understand and get information from out there, if that makes sense. Yeah, data privacy, data integrity, all are very important. Absolutely, absolutely. And it it's, I mean, there's huge liabilities there. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, right. you know, the other thing is just, we're spending a lot of time looking at AI these days, but having organizational guidelines and safeguards and, you know, somebody, somebody can post on your internal, you know, chat group. Oh, look, I learned how to make X, uh, X, Y, Z out of it using AI. Um, and suddenly everybody's making X, Y, Z out of using AI. And we don't know what they're relying on. We don't know what, what they, where their data is coming from. Um, you know, you need to have those organizational policies in place. And I think a lot of, you know, it's only November that ChatGPT was published for the first time. Um, just in six months, really eight months, we've just come so far, but a lot of organizations have not got these kinds of safety rules and guidelines and guardrails in place yet. So, yeah, Linda, I think that's also for another conversation, a deeper mm -hmm. dive. Absolutely. That's for the next webinar, okay? We're going to focus <laughs> on AI and get to the bottom of it and make us feel safe. <laughs> well, I don't know that we're ever going to feel safe, but <laughs> that's kind of, well, I don't know. But I think there are a lot of really interesting, I mean, AI is a new technology that's getting adopted by organizations. So the change management kinds of things that we would do with any other technology are extremely relevant and more because, I mean, this is, this is huge. It's the biggest thing since the beginning of the internet. So. It is. It is. It is. Well, um, I don't see any more. Wait, wait. I got another question. There's something Nancy posted. Uh, the more we can AI the VRU, the more benefit we have in training new call center agents by not having to train for everything up front. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. And and Nancy, I think that is something. This is this whole point of um, the more we can in in you know enable and engage our agents um, in using leveraging that technology for good not evil. Um, <laughs> the it is you're right. People are going to be learning on the job. They're going to be continuously improving. And I think the other thing is you know we that whole car wash method of putting the agents through upfront training and then hoping they're all bright shiny new cars. Um, and ready to go, we know over, you know, that isn't great. So is this is a new tool that we have to um, improve upon that old car wash model of training. Great, great. Well, um, I don't see any other more questions coming through. So I'm gonna give back some time to our friends that joined us today. And I wanna thank you, Linda, for such a great discussion and a big thank you to everyone for joining us for your time and attention. And we hope you'll join us again for another of our upcoming webinars. Go to gpstrategies.com, check it out under webinars. And uh, I wish everyone on the call a wonderful and productive rest of your day. This webinar was brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we help organizations transform through their people. You can access more webinars or download additional resources by visiting the GP Strategies resource library. The link is on your screen and in the description.